we begin in Genesis chapter 1. In fact, most of this message, if not all, is going to be from the book of Genesis. And today's message is called The Great Separations of Genesis. The Great Separations of Genesis. We often in the church are fail to recognize that Christians are to be separated. And I've spoken on separation many times in many different ways, separation in life. We have been lied to to believe that we don't have to be separated, that we can be just like the world, or we, can, we don't have to do the things that the Bible says, that as long as you say that you're a Christian, as long as you pray a little prayer that you're saved, and that is contrary to the Word of God. You have to be separated, as this man we just read about in the martyr's mirror, you have to be separated and you have to stand against what is evil and sometimes stand against the law of the land you live in. Amen? Amen. Now that, uh, that goes against what many people consider civil duty, that you owe it to the country you live in to, um, to live according to their law and the Bible says to live according to the law of the land unless it disagrees with the Word of God. We ought to obey God rather than man. So I'm going to give you at least five today. I may, I may count more than that, but at least five distinct separations that I want to focus on in the book of Genesis today. Now, when you think about the book of Genesis, it is the beginning. It is the book that Moses wrote, that God gave him, the account of creation, the account of how it all began. Uh, just this past week, I was watching a documentary on space exploration and space travel and how they, uh, all they had to go through to get to the moon and how they're planning on um, not just unmanned, but manned trips to Mars and beyond someday. And, and sadly, this scientist said, we're, we're still trying to discover our origins. We're still trying to discover where we came from. How did we get here? And the scientist said, why did Earth change so differently than the rest of the universe? Why is Earth different than all the other places that we have within our power to see and observe? Why is Earth different? And I just shook my head. I just sat there and watched that thinking, really? You know, I mean, as Christians, we should know why we're here, shouldn't we? God yeah. created us. And these separations are so clear in the Bible, and yet the devil will confuse them to you. He will confuse them to the world. He will tell you that they're, they're not for everybody, or they're no longer for today, or they don't make any difference, or they don't exist, or whatever lie he wants to tell you. But these separations that God established are established. Wow. They are here. They are, they are forever. They are established. So in Genesis chapter 1, we're going to look at the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The heaven and the earth. Now I looked at the word, the Hebrew word for heaven, and it means the heavens, the the excuse me, celestial part of our existence, things outside this planet, but they also, the word can mean the abode of God, the abode of God. Now, people always want to bring up the question, what came before creation? I don't know. I don't know. But I, I'm more concerned with what's happening next than what happened before, you know? What, what's going to happen in the future? Um, when he created heaven and earth, he created two distinct places. And, I, and the reason I want to bring this out first is that God established this, and yet even Christians confuse this. God established heaven and earth, and yet Christians sometimes want to make this heaven. They sometimes want to make this a paradise. They sometimes forget that we're not to love this world, right? We're supposed to not look to this life. We're supposed to look toward heaven and our eternal life. Mm -hmm. That man we read about a minute ago, 
he said he thanked God that he could finally get on to life. Amen. You know, he could finally give up this flesh that he was chosen worthy to to give up and go on toward real life. You know, you we all have great periods of time when life is great. When we're not suffering, when our bills are paid, uh, we have children that are smiling and happy. Um, everybody, you know, everybody's doing their thing and life's going on like normal. We all have those times in our life when we tend to forget that this is not heaven. Right. And then tragedy strikes, and then death comes, and then sickness comes, and then problems arise, and our flesh fails. I woke up this morning in real pain with my arthritis in my joints and really I'm still having a hard time. I had a hard time playing the guitar this morning and uh, and I realized just in that even that this body is temporary. It's temporary and thank God it is. You don't want to go through eternity with this body. Right. You want a new body and there's only one way to get that new body. God established heaven and earth and it is up to us to remember that heaven is heaven and earth is earth. Amen? <clears throat> the second thing I want to look at is in verse 26. Now there's other things in here. If you go back and study this, there are other things that God established. For instance, he, he said light and dark. Light and darkness. Right? He established those things. He separated water from the land. Now there are a lot of separations in there, and I, and I want you and encourage you to study that further, but I want to point out these five this morning. So look in verse 26. Excuse me. Yes, verse 26. Um, the second thing is a separation in life between man and the animals, and between man and plant life, and all other living things. Man is a distinct entity. Look at verse 26. God said, Let us make man in our image and after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. But God created man in his image, and he separated man from living things. Now this also is a thing that even church people have forgotten is that men or humans and animals are different. We have humanized our pets so that we forget that they're they're not human. People have uh, have given words like fur babies to their to their animals and and they dote on their animals so much that they tend to to uh, put more emphasis on them than they do on the life of an unborn child. You know, we, we've got laws against against an eagle egg and damaging an eagle egg, but we have a law that says you can kill an unborn baby up to a certain length of time. That That is bizarre to me. That is beyond weird for a culture to be like that, that they put more emphasis on nature than they do on man. God just said it's not that way. He said man is in God's image. Man is in God's image. And so as we look at animals, we re we've got to realize they're not to be abused, but they are different than we are. They do not have a soul. They do not die and go to animal heaven, dog heaven, cat heaven. Um, if God chooses to have them in heaven, that's his, that's his design, his business. But he says that man is created in his image. And he says to have dominion over the fish of the sea and the fowl of the air and the cattle and all the earth and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So man is had to have dominion over nature. That does not mean abusing nature. That does not mean taking advantage of nature and destroying nature. But we have a, an obligation. If you have dominion over something, you have an obligation to it, do you not? Amen? We have an obligation to the things of nature. And so God, God said there's a separation between man and all other life. I was reading through uh, a uh, 
I guess it's called a blog where uh, it was about firewood and um, different kinds of trees that grow and somebody was asking the question you know how do you get rid of uh, unwanted trees or how do you get what do you do with trees that are to be culled out or whatever that weren't good for firewood and there was I, I distinctly remember it was a lady that wrote in and she said that's a senseless waste of life that was her that was her phrase that killing that tree was a senseless waste of life. And maybe y'all remember one time when we was with some people and they, a child reached up and broke a, a limb off and, the, and the, one of the men said, you know, what would, how would you feel if somebody broke your finger off? And you know, we have, we have basically turned back to pagans in that we're worshiping nature again and doing that and acting as if cutting a limb off of a tree is worse than taking someone's limb off their body right. or equal to. That is ridiculous. God said man would have dominion over the fowls of the air, the cattle of the land, the fish of the sea. Mm -hmm. And so we are distinctly different, are we not? Right. Amen. Uh, one of the things that has caused this kind of thing is even simple things like Disney cartoons where uh, you know poor Bambi you know poor Bambi and oh, Bambi's right. daddy got got shot poor, by the right. hunter poor Bambi you know and, right. and animals that talk in cartoons uh, it seems simple but you know we we uh, have so much computerized special effects that animals can dance and talk and sing and do everything else have personalities and things that are beyond what they actually do in nature. So I want you to, I want to remind you that God said that they're different and they always Amen. will be different. Amen. Uh, verse 27 is the third thing I want to point out. So God created man in his own image in the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Male and female created he them. God said there's a distinction between male and female. Amen. I'm sorry for those who believe different, that they believe there's a third sex or a third uh, type of person or a person that doesn't fall into any of those or he's born one way but he actually was meant to be the other way. I know that that our that, that nature is, is uh, you know, in a fallen state, but that is ridiculous. That even goes against nature to believe that there is a somehow a a non-sex or a third sex that does not reproduce. Nature can't even survive like that. Right. In the animal world, in the plant world, there has to be male and female. Amen? That's right. So, look at that again. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Did you know that the two attributes of male and female are both parts of God? Did you know that that's why children need both parents, father Amen. and mother? Amen. Because the father has attributes of God that the mother doesn't have, and the mother has attributes of God that the father doesn't have, and it takes both of those to be one flesh to have the right kind of parenting that children need. Amen. And when you Amen. raise children in an environment where you think that you can have two fathers or two mothers, uh, that child is going to be really messed up in his thinking. And mankind cannot continue on like that. Male and female is what God created us, and that's what we are. Right. Uh, most people have forgotten this, and another thing they've forgotten in the Word of God is God gave roles or jobs for male and female. He said, mothers, you're supposed to do this. Fathers, you're supposed to do this. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, submit to your husbands. There is an order in the creation, is there not? Right. And all of this is a separation that God gave from the beginning in Genesis. Uh, male and female created he them. The fourth thing, we're going to skip to chapter 3, verse 3. <clears throat> the fourth thing that I want to point out today is a separation 
in right and wrong. Now we could have looked at that in light and darkness in chapter one, but this is literal that there was a there is something right to do and there's something wrong to do. And let's look at verse three, chapter three. But of the fruit of the garden of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, let neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. So this is Eve speaking to Satan in the form of a serpent. And Eve says, Of the fruit of the tree of the garden, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. We want to bend morals. We want to adjust them to fit our needs. We want to do what we think is not really that harmful to us. We want to try to second-guess God and his rules and his commands, and yet we can't do that. I'm sorry, we can't do it. We can't make up our own rules. There is no such thing as situation ethics, and if you've never heard that term, you need to look it up. Situation ethics. Situation ethics says uh, lying can be okay. Lying can be okay. It's okay to lie. It depends on the situation. And they start to try to bend it around and give you things, put you in a bind and say, you know, well, wouldn't it be better to actually say the dress is ugly? You know, I mean, just just silly things like that. God says that there is a right and a wrong. And it is Jehovah God that has established what is moral and what is immoral. Not man. Man does not establish those things. If man established them, they would be always shifting. Well, suppose Andy and I bought property adjacent to each other. And I said, you know what, I think the property line's over here. And Andy said, well, I think it's over here. I mean, there's a row of trees right there. That looks like the property line. And I said, yeah, but you know, I heard that my great-grandfather said that he remembered when there was a fence down there. And we're always arguing about where the property line moves. And if you are adjusting morals according to your life, you're getting over in somebody else's property line. You're moving that around according to what you think ought to be right, and it's never going to be established. Mm-hmm. We're always going to be stepping on somebody's toes. Now, there are, there are some people that say, well, you know, I, ne- I have a, a one code that I follow, harm nothing living. Well, good luck with that. Good luck with that if that's your... If that's your uh, philosophy that you're not going to harm anything living because uh, you know your lifestyle is offensive to God and it's offensive to me and it, it is being immoral and corrupt is going to bring destruction to our land that is your decision but I don't agree with it so how are you going to harm no, nothing Amen? Amen. so we have moral absolutes that God has established and even those who do not believe them can be blessed by living by them. Do you know that? That's right. This nation, whether people were Christian or not, all were. it was established on the Ten Commandments and, and Christianity. And this nation, whether you like anything that happened or dislike anything that happened in history, it doesn't matter. This nation was blessed because it was based on that. It was not perfect. And in the beginning, there were a lot of mistakes and a lot of problems. But this country was based on Christianity. And in this, we will be blessed if we follow God's rules. The Ten Commandments that people want to throw out right now, that used to be on every judicial building and it's in the Supreme Court, those things were established many years ago as being basic rules that we live by. And I've often gone through them, one through ten, and said, which one of these do you disagree with? It has to be the ones about God, because surely you couldn't say you shouldn't murder and you shouldn't commit adultery and you know all those things that we live by. But they want to throw out every rule and every law and create ones that step on freedom. That's what they want. You know, it's a backwards thinking to think that rules do away with freedom. Rules bring freedom. Amen? Amen. So that's the full separation is between right and wrong. So let's go back to um, 
Well, actually, let's look at verse 4. And the serpent said unto the woman, You shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open, and you shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. So the last separation is the separation between God and man. God established you to be different. Man wants to set himself up as God now. Man wants to set himself up that he is equivalent to God. People want to elevate someone up to the place of God. They want to talk about, you know, how he's the Savior or he's, he's the Deliverer or whatever they want to call someone that's their hero. And they want to say that that person is equivalent to God or they put them above God. And there is a separation between God and man. And God, and you are not God, and you're never going to be God. In all eternity, you're never going to be God. You're not going to be little gods, as the Mormons teach. Yeah. You're not going to be side by side up there with God. He's always going to be God. You're going to be kindred spirits with Jesus Christ, but you're not going to be Jesus Christ. You're going to be man delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I remember a teaching that started going around, and I guess it still is. Don't say that I'm a sinner saved by grace. Don't be, don't be calling me a sinner anymore. I'm not a sinner anymore. I'm delivered. They want to separate themselves from the fact that they're not God. They want to say, you know, I'm part of God. You're part of God. We're all part of God. God is the collective existence of all mankind. And that's not true. That's not true. One day you will stand before God and you will realize He's up there and I'm down here. He's up there on the throne and I'm standing before Him being judged. And when that day comes, we will all come to the realization that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And there will be no denying who He is and who you are. We need to remember that God separated that distinctly in the book of Genesis, in creation. He said that he created us in his image. Satan lied and said, if you eat this, if you do this wrong thing, you'll be like God. Right. Satan actually spilled the beans right there. He told him, you're not like God. Didn't he? Yep. He kind of let it out right there. You're not like God. There's a distinct separation between God and man. I'm sure you could read through this and find more, and I want you to. I want you to read through Genesis and find the separations that God made in creation. And, and as I close, even think about the last, the, the little things of light and darkness. Look around this room. Everybody just look around this room at something. As you look around this room, you see different colors, you see different contrasts, you see different shapes. You have vision that allows you to see where if you had your eyes closed or if you were totally blind, you could not see. There is a distinction in the things because of light and darkness. A contrast between light and darkness. The contrast between good and evil is that way also. When you see what people become when they be go off the road of unrighteousness when they go against God's word when you see that you find out that it leads to destruction and then you begin to see what righteousness does walking a righteous life following God's words doing what's right according to his will not according to my will when you follow that you begin to see a contrast and it begins to paint a picture just like this room and everything you see in this room amen I want you to think about these separations. We don't like the word separation. We don't like that. We, we think that we should all be able to get along and, and just be able to do whatever we want to do and live and wake up every day and just live according to our own will. And that, that does not work. That goes contrary to God's plan for your life. Your life is not about pleasing your flesh. It's not about doing what you think ought to be done. It's not about having fun 
I was telling uh, Angie about a quote from A.W. Tozer that I had read. I think it's A.W. Tozer. He said that a church that has to um, entertain to get people to come in is not a church. Amen. That if you have to be entertained in order to get excited about church, in fact, a lot of churches promote, promote themselves that way. The exciting church, the church that's different, we do things different. Differently, I should say. We do things differently. We're exciting. Come here if you want to be excited. You know, it's no longer a place that you go when you're sick. It'd be, it'd be the same as advertising a hospital instead of saying, you know, if you're sick, and if you feel broken, or if you feel down, or if you're injured, come here and we will we will get you healed. Instead of doing that, if they said, you know, you come here and you can get high. You can feel good. We got some good drugs here. That's the same the same thing that the church is doing. They're saying, you come here and we'll make you feel good. You, you need to be part of our quote-unquote worship where you'll feel good when you leave. You'll be charged up when you leave. Right? I saw another good quote from Martin Luther this week. It said, uh, hang on just a minute. True re in true repentance, a man is never satisfied with just repenting. We just need to be different. We need to realize that we, we really failed. And it should not be enough for us to just say, I'm sorry, God, and go on with our life. We should be so broken in our repentance, in our realization, that we have really failed God and come short of His glory. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Father, I come before you this morning asking that you help us to understand that the separations that you established were for our good. They were for the divine plan of God that man would see he is different, that he needs a Savior, that he is different than God, He's different than the animals, that men and women are different. All these things that you that you established, Father, is so that we could clearly see reality. And that reality is that we are fallen beings and we need a Savior. And I pray that if anyone, in the sound of my voice, does not know you, Lord, that they would repent and turn again to you, that they would find life in you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.